Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd in Washington on what is an historic day and a perilous moment in American politics. This is the scene right now. This is the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court as both uh, pro-choice uh, demonstrators and pro-life demonstrators continue to gather after the courts expected, but still no less dramatic ruling, overturning 50 years of precedent, eliminating the constitutional right to an abortion. We heard the president this afternoon urge demonstrations across the country to remain peaceful. The ruling is one for the history books, and it sets in motion an avalanche of legal, medical, political, and cultural fallout at a time when you have to ask yourself if this country can handle yet another divisive issue. Thirteen states with trigger laws on the books are going to be banning abortions immediately or within a very short period of time. Oklahoma's attorney general, for example, announced this afternoon that his state will now prohibit abortions on demand. In the coming weeks, it's expected that roughly half of the states in this country will make the procedure illegal, even in instances of rape or incest. Not in every one of those cases, but in some of them. It's the first time ever that a Supreme Court has granted a widely recognized right and then taken it away. What that means for other court precedents, upholding the right to same-sex marriage, contraception use, and beyond, Boy, is that a major question mark. Anything that was tied to the so-called right to privacy. Then there's the political fallout. We're just months away from the midterms. Clearly, that's on the president's mind as he looks to energize his base and avoid losing control of Congress in November. Here was some of his reaction this afternoon. This fall, we must elect more senators and representatives who will codify women's right to choose into federal law once again. Elect more state leaders to protect this right at the local level. This fall, Roe is on the ballot. Personal freedoms are on the ballot. The right to privacy, liberty, equality, they're all on the ballot. And moments ago, Vice President Harris addressed the ruling while traveling in Chicago, echoing the president's comments and urging supporters to use the ballot box as a tool to combat the court's ruling. The bottom line, actually, though, is the Supreme Court said that abortion rights now have to be decided at the ballot box. They didn't say it that explicitly, but when you do what you did, it now means it is an election issue all the time, not just this one. I'm joined now by my NBC News colleagues for reaction here at the Supreme Court and from states around the country facing new restrictions. Justice correspondent Pete Williams is here to give us the legal breakdown. Julia Ainsley's outside of the Supreme Court. Kathy Park in Jackson, Mississippi, right near... The clinic that brought this case, uh, Dasha Burns, is in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Josh Letterman is at the White House. Pete, let me start with you, and let's break down the rulings here, because you have Alito's ruling, you have the Thomas concurring, and, and Kavanaugh concurring, you have Roberts' uh, own version of this. And I guess, what is operational and what isn't? I know what Alito wrote is operational, but then Kavanaugh wrote something about what this does and how operational is that? So just, I'd like to break down each one of these concurring opinions, not just Alito, but start with Alito. Okay, remember how this case came to the Supreme Court. It was a challenge based on Mississippi's law that would ban abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. So the court granted the case limited to one question. Can states ban abortion before the age of fetal viability? That was the question before the court, and the court today said the answer to that is yes. That vote was 6-3 to three with Chief Justice Roberts joining with the other conservatives. On the question of overturning Roe versus Wade, the vote was 5-4. to four. Roberts said we don't need to go that far to answer that question about viability. Now, of course, once you take away the viability uh, benchmark, say the courts can ban abortion before the age of viability, then you're on a sliding scale that eventually gets rid of Roe v. Wade anyway. But, in, but he said the court went too fast in, in overturning Roe now. So those are the two holdings. The Mississippi law is upheld. Roe and all the follow-on cases over 50 years sustaining the abortion right are now overturned. Justice Brett Kavanaugh, in a concurring opinion, now, normally speaking, a concurrence would be just his own opinion. But because the Roe case is five to four, if he had peeled away, that would only be four, it wouldn't be a majority. So what he says in his concurrence is controlling. He says, in his view, a state cannot ban someone in a state that where abortion becomes illegal 
can't ban that person or make it a crime for them to go to a state where abortion is legal in order to get the procedure. So that is also a holding of the Supreme Court today. Now, the, the other question that you got to get, gets to what the court said about why it's ruling this way. Justice Alito wrote the draft opinion or, uh, that leaked in February. This opinion today tracks it very closely. He says you can't find the right to abortion in the Constitution. And so to find out whether it's a substantive due process right from the 14th Amendment, the test is, is it something that is deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions and is essential to a concept of ordered liberty? And that by that test, he says, Roe flunks the test because Roe abortion was illegal at the time of the founding and at the time the 14th Amendment was adopted in most of the states. Uh, so, he says, abortion is different. Abortion is the reason that the ruling, he says, twice, the ruling is only about the abortion right and not about other precedents like interracial marriage, same-sex marriage, the right to receive, uh, uh, refuse medical treatment, the right to choose how your children get educated and so forth. He said none of those are at risk here. This, this decision, he says, doesn't invite, involve them at all because abortion is different. There's a moral aspect to it because there's a potential life involved, and that's why abortion is different. Justice Clarence Thomas says, well, maybe we should look at those other decisions that derive from that 14th Amendment analysis and that so-called right to privacy, including the contraceptive, same-sex marriage, intimate sexual relations, and so forth. I, I would point out that it certainly does the logic of the of Alito's ruling and what he says about it are to some extent in tension. And this is what the the dissent says. It says this is hypocritical to say, well, here's the test. Is it deeply rooted in the history? But on the other hand, don't worry about these because we promise we won't touch them. Um, the dissenters say, you know, that's you can't have it both ways. I, I will say about same sex marriage, there is one difference in that ruling because you can also read the same sex marriage ruling as saying that it's based on equal protection, that a man can marry, mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 could, you know, until the decision was made, a man could marry a woman but not a man. And the Supreme Court said that's that's part of the problem with the laws against same sex marriage. All right, I got one quick follow up, and I know we have a lot of folks, but which is this, Pete? You talked about, you said, Brett Kavanaugh's concurring opinion was controlling. It has to do with going out of state to get uh, an abortion procedure. Does, yes. does, does that protection apply to the medical personnel that give that advice to that person that decides to cross state lines if they're practicing medicine in a state that bans abortion? Yeah, unclear, I think. And, of course, this is what Attorney General Merrick Garland said today in his statement, mm -hmm. that not only should the right to travel be recognized, but this right to give advice and advise patients should also be recognized. Joy Ainsley, um, I guess now the question is, what is it, it, what, you're outside there, you're hearing this. What are you hearing left and right on this? How celebratory on the right? Is this uh, the end or the, be, or the end of the beginning for the pro-life movement? And what kind of... Uh, what kind of actions are folks on the abortion rights side of the aisle asking for going forward? Chuck, it's, it's a little hard to hear you out here, but I'm going to tell you what I'm hearing from the people on the ground here. I mean, if you need to see how divisive this issue and this decision is in this country, look no farther than the crowd I'm standing in. We just saw a pro-life demonstrator, a, an anti-abortion demonstrator, jump the fence here. He was escorted out by police and booed by the crowd. You have people to my left with pictures of babies saying, don't tread on me. You have people here obviously leading uh, anti uh, pro-abortion access rallies, very upset about the decision today. We've seen people square off in each other's faces. We've seen more security come. The crowd gets thicker, and it's expected to continue like this overnight because of this opinion as more and more people get the news of it and come in to uh, into this rally here. We've got people coming through. It's, it's, it's quite busy here. I do want you to listen to some of the things that people told me today. And we first heard from people who were very upset about this decision. Let's first hear from those people who are pro-abortion access. Here's what they had to say. I was in the middle of praying when we found out the decision was made. And I am I'm overjoyed right now. I, it, 
there's honestly no words that can describe the way that I feel right now. Um, I've been waiting for this for a long time, and I know other people have been waiting for this longer than I have. I'm excited, but we all, as if you can, you can see the celebration, but we all know this is not where the work ends. This is where it begins, because from I, anyone you can ask, this is what we'll be working for for the rest of our lives, to make abortion illegal, unthinkable, and unnecessary. Uh, so, for example, for, for me personally, I'm adopted. So, so knowing other mothers out there who can't, who can't make a choice is pretty hard to see. Like, I was lucky. And I have a wonderful mother. This is insane. It feels like a betrayal. It feels like my country doesn't love me and appreciate my body as a woman. To see us going back to knitting needles and the whole thing, I, I just, I'm, I'm stunned. I, I don't, I don't understand. So, and actually, Chuck, I should add that the leader of this rally over here just now said that she wants to lead the uh, pro-abortion access group to Justice Thomas's house. They also started chanting right now about Jenny Thomas, the wife of Justice Thomas, yeah. calling her an insurrectionist, obviously, because of some of the details that have recently come out during the January 6th hearings about her role in the election. Now she wants to lead a crowd to the justice's house. This, of course, is the very reason why there is increased security, not only here, but at justice's residences, yep. of course, following what we know to be someone who wanted to threaten Brett Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh, just a, a few days ago. So the mood here is high. We'll, we'll see if these people do leave here now and, in fact, go to Justice Thomas's house. But it's not unthinkable to think that a lot of people here would have the addresses of justices and want to bring this issue directly to their doorsteps, hopefully in a peaceful protest. But, you know, it's something we have to watch, especially yeah. as this crowd grows more tense with so much emotion on the yeah. line. It's a terrible look for the Supreme Court that they refuse to um, go in person to present these to present these cases here. Uh, I think it only adds to um, adds to the frustration, adds to the idea that it's it's uh, it, nobody knows quite what's going on. Julie Angeli in front of the Supreme Court. I want to go to a couple of states where, with some immediate fallout before we get to the White House. Let's go down to Mississippi. That's where we have Kathy Park standing by. It was this uh, clinic that brought this case. Um, what's the future of this clinic? Uh, and if where do where do women who need uh, access uh, to abortion go now? So, Chuck, uh, we are actually just a few miles from that clinic. And as you mentioned, this is the last remaining clinic here in the state of Mississippi. And leading up to this point, the state has been very uh, restrictive when it comes to abortion rights. So because this is a trigger law state here in the state of Mississippi, there is a 10 day window. Essentially, the attorney general will need to certify this decision that came down by the Supreme Court. And uh, Lynn Finn, she, she tweeted out earlier today, shortly after that decision came out, she called this a victory. So uh, following that it's likely that it will be official any day now. But going back to that clinic, um, right now we should be hearing momentarily from organizers with that clinic. And we spoke with them uh, shortly after that leak came out in May. And, and they said they were disappointed that the Supreme Court even took this case. So we can understandably uh, hear the, the disappointment, the anger. But they also said that they're not surprised uh, that this announcement would, would be handed down today. But looking ahead, what happens next? Because I mentioned this is a trigger law state, and after that 10 day window, uh, comes to an end, that clinic will ultimately close. And they have been working behind the scenes to open up another clinic, this one in New Mexico. But also, they've been trying to get supporters, raise mo money to, to help these women uh, receive abortions uh, legally and safely. But, but Chuck, it's going to be hours away, the closest clinic being in Illinois. Uh, so the drive time will be anywhere between seven hours to 22 hours. And of course, you know, you've been hearing the, the headlines that this will disproportionately impact women of color, poor women who don't necessarily have the resources uh, and, and the time to take off from work to, to access uh, these services. So that is a big question looking ahead uh, beyond that 10-day window. I also asked uh, folks here on the ground, how will they enforce this? And that, that also is a big question. How will they prosecute this if, if people do happen to get these abortions kind of underground? Chuck? 
Kathy Park in Mississippi, and, and as she pointed out, we're about to hear a little more detail on what's the future of that clinic uh, in Mississippi, and uh, we may get back to you on that, Kathy. Let's go to Michigan. Michigan is a, another place where politically this could become uh, ground zero. They have a law on the books that bans abortion immediately, uh, total ban on abortion that goes back to 1931. There is an injunction against it, so it is unclear what happens next. Dasha, you've been there all day talking with folks. Um, do you have a better idea of what is next in Michigan and what it, you know, in three weeks, if someone's look uh, uh, needs um, access to abortion, what's going to happen? So, Chuck, there are still a lot of questions. The governor has filed a lawsuit to invalidate that 1931 law that bans abortion with no exceptions. The state's Republican legislature, though, has uh, filed to defend uh, that law. So they are uh, for this anti-abortion 1931 uh, law. What happens next? We're, we don't know exactly the timeline for how long this injunction will last. Right now, abortion is still legal. Providers can continue to do what they've been doing. How long can they do that? It, that's the question mark. Uh, the governor just today did ask the court to expedite this case, so hopefully we will get an answer soon. But as I was speaking with Attorney General Dana Nessel today, she held a press briefing. Uh, she was talking about how we saw today that court rulings that people expect to last don't necessarily last. They can be overturned. So what folks are looking towards now is this ballot proposal for November. Uh, abortion rights groups are working to get enough signatures. They need over just about 425,000 signatures by July 11th to get uh, that ballot uh, proposal in place for November. That would enshrine abortion rights in Michigan state constitution. So uh, leadership right now that is uh, working to protect abortion rights say that's actually probably the best and most powerful avenue to make sure that abortion rights are protected beyond uh, this administration. Because, of course, we've got an election coming up in November. This is absolutely going to be front and center. But then there's an election after that, an election after that. And uh, who knows who will be in power then. So the goal for this administration right now, for the governor, for the AG, is to put protections in place that will outlast uh, their tenure, Chuck. And then there's this, what can you tell me about this referendum that's on the ballot. Is that definitely going to be on the ballot in November or not? Well, that's, that's what we're waiting to find out, Chuck. This is uh, the next few weeks are going to be critical for people sort of battling on both sides of this issue. This is what's complicated, right? This happens in Washington, and then there's a trickle effect for states and voters in these states who are really unsure what's going to happen next. I had a woman walk up to me, uh, Virginia DeHaan. She came up to me in tears. She was 18 years old when Roe fell, and she's trying to grapple with the decision in D.C., and what it's going to mean for her in this state, which is really still unclear. Uh, the, the leadership here, both the governor and their attorney general, say the situation is dire, but still hopeful. But that's not a clear-cut answer here, Chuck. Dasha Burns in Michigan, where I promise you folks, uh, abortion, the issue of abortion, will be front and center in that governor's race because Absolutely. of all of this uncertainty of the state law. Um, uh, Dasha Burns, thank you. Now let's go to the White House. Josh Letterman, President Biden came out. He made in many ways a, a try to use this as a little bit of a rallying cry for the midterms, basically saying, look, there's limitations on what can get done. You're going to need to elect more, uh, more senators, more members of Congress who support a right to abortion access. So um, there's been some talk of declaring a public health emergency. That's about the one it seems concrete thing this administration could do. Can you explain what the thinking is and, and what whether they're going to pursue this? Well, that is an idea, Chuck, that has mostly come from uh, progressive groups and some Democratic uh, lawmakers, not one that we have heard at all uh, being floated by members of the administration. But uh, the basic idea would be that you're going to have a handful of states that uh, obviously are going to become safe havens for abortion, uh, where if you're someone in a state that is not going to have legal abortion anymore, uh, you're going to have all of those people flocking uh, and potentially overwhelming the health care systems uh, and the limited 
abortion clinics that exist in states uh, where abortion will continue uh, to remain legal. So uh, the idea is that one of the things that declaring a national public health emergency uh, could do would allow the federal government to direct more resources to places that are going to bear the brunt uh, of all of those people seeking abortions uh, going to those uh, specific states. But really, the ideas that we have heard the White House uh, talking about and saying uh, are the most fruitful ways for them to move forward on this issue have to do more with uh, protecting and enforcing existing laws, making sure that uh, the Justice Department, for example, uh, is not allowing people to infringe on uh, the ability for someone to go from one state to another uh, of, of their own free will to, uh, to seek an abortion. Uh, likewise, making sure that uh, states cannot simply decide to throw out the science of the FDA, which has determined that certain uh, medical abortion pills uh, are both safe and uh, effective. And so the president trying to focus attention in his remarks uh, today on what his administration can and will do while acknowledging that it is very limited, just like we've talked on uh, gun control and everything else about how there's so little the president can do without Congress. Uh, that is the case here as well. President Biden being very open about the fact that he cannot sign some executive order and simply restore a right that the Supreme Court took away today. Uh, and that is why the president making this explicit political call to action, telling people, if you want this to change, today does not have to be the final decision, but you have to go and vote for lawmakers uh, who are going to uh, vote themselves to restore a rights for abortion across the country. Yeah, no, I think we are headed for what's been um, a growing uh, sort of in some ways uh, new tradition here. The more divided we are, the higher election turnout can get. Uh, and we may be headed for something like that with these midterms. Josh Letterman at the White House, thank you. Before that, Pete Williams, Joy Ainsley, Kathy Park, and Dasha Burns helping us get all aspects of the story. Coming up, some Democratic-led uh, states prepare for a post-row reality. The governor of Illinois is surrounded by a lot of states that, don't, uh, that are going to be banning abortion. How are they preparing for that? And then I'll be speaking with Michigan's attorney general. Uh, as we go deeper into the discussion I had with Dasha Burns about what is the future of abortion access in the state of Michigan, where right now it could end up being complete, a total and complete ban. We'll have much more on the fallout from today's groundbreaking Supreme Court decision. What happens next? Where are we headed as a country? You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. Today's Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe v. Wade gives state leaders the power to determine whether abortion will be allowed in their states, with what kinds of restrictions, and whether to enforce laws on the books. Ruling could shake up races for governor, attorneys general, and other statewide and local offices this November. And while some states are expected to enact more restrictions, there are states that currently protect abortion rights, and they are now preparing for an influx of out-of-state residents seeking abortions. Joined now by two Democratic officials that are trying to protect abortion rights in their states. One is the governor of Illinois, J.B. Pritzker, who has already announced a plan to call a special legislative session in order to strengthen uh, the state's abortion protections. And I'll be speaking with, after the governor, Michigan's Attorney General Daniel Nassel, uh, who says she will not enforce the 1931 Michigan ban. The question is, what happens if others decide to do it? We'll get a lot more, uh, hopefully, answers to those questions as well. But let me start with you, Governor Pritzker. Let's start with um, what it is that you believe the state of Illinois needs to do to add protections. Is, it, is this about enshrining it in the state constitution? What is it that you're seeking the legislature to do? So the first thing I can tell you is that we got rid of our trigger laws a few years ago. We have terrific uh, women legislators in Illinois who led the fight. Uh, and I've been their ally in that. We also passed the Reproductive Health Act back in 2019 when I first became governor. Uh, we have more that we need to do. Uh, first of all, we have enshrined into uh, law in Illinois that women have uh, their reproductive rights guaranteed, but we're seeing tens of thousands, potentially, of women coming from states all around us. Nearly everyone has a trigger law. And today, it's illegal in their states. So we expect that uh, more than the 10,000 we saw last year coming from states around us and all the way uh, to Texas, uh, we will see 20,000 or potentially 30,000 because people do need to exercise those rights. So we're going to need to expand capacity in our state. We're going to need to make sure that we have the healthcare personnel that are necessary uh, to perform these procedures and to guarantee that uh, medical abortion is available. 
Yeah, I want to put up a, uh, you talked about the different um, out of states. You guys have tracked this by state. Uh, and this is in 2020. It was Missouri where you had the most people going across state lines. Um, and you, you only had a trickle from Wisconsin and Michigan. Obviously, those are two places where we could have trigger laws. So you're at 20,000 out. What's your expectation, double or triple, that you have to prepare for? Well, we're going to prepare for as many as we need to. Um, and again, capacity means personnel and it means space. Uh, we have more than 90 uh, clinics across the state. Some are right on the borders uh, and prepared to take the influx. Uh, some need more capacity. Chicago, of course, butts up against Indiana, where they're about to pass laws to uh, make abortion illegal entirely. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have a lot to do here um, to make sure that we're protecting the women in our state, but we've done a lot in that regard. But now it's about making sure that we're protecting rights for people all over the country. There may be some people that come into the state that uh, need access to, uh, uh, to abortion, but can't afford it. Um, can you afford to pay for this as a state? There are private organizations and foundations that have helped uh, people do that. We've been supporting the logistics operations for people coming from out of state so they can find a place to stay. They can get a meal if they need one uh, and get the support that they need uh, to get the procedure that they want. But we're not looking to pay for out of state people coming to Illinois to exercise those rights. But we are looking to support the organizations that are providing those, uh, you know, supports. And that includes especially the providers themselves. Take a step back. Look, you're somebody that you're running for reelection. You, you know, you, you, you're a state leader, pretty large state. Who knows? Maybe you decide to run for, for, for something higher than that. And I asked the question this way. This country we're pretty divided right now. We've been divided for a while, but we're, if it's possible to, to somehow get more divided, get more polarized, and I fear more pugilistic, um, how, do, how do you turn down the temperature when it, it looks like there's, there's no end to this divisiveness, particularly when you have a very activist, aggressive, uh, conservative movement these days that feels very empowered? Well, it seems reasonable to me to continue doing what we've always been doing in Illinois, protecting women. Um, there isn't a lot of change that will occur in Illinois for people who live in Illinois because we've protected a woman's right to choose. Uh, the change will be that there are people who need to, uh, you know, exercise their rights who are going to come to Illinois and try to do that. So uh, is that, a you know, an attack on some other state? No. Uh, that is simply standing up for what I think are fundamental rights that, uh, you know, that are, are reasonable for us to fight for. I guess address, though, you know, how, are, what kind of concern do you have about where the country is right now? I am very concerned that we now have an extremist Supreme Court that seems on the verge of doing much worse than what they've done, which seems awful already. Uh, so going after the broad set of rights that are protected by a right to privacy. So imagine if we went back to a day when in order to get birth control, you a woman would have to ask her husband for permission. Uh, or imagine if a young woman who's got a career uh, would like to get birth control but can't because it's outlawed in her state. Uh, so these are, you know, I, I cannot imagine, I'm 57 years old, I could not imagine that we would see rights contracting in our country and not expanding. Yeah. So I, I'm deeply concerned, and I do think that, as you point out, I like the word pugilistic, uh, I do think that we're going to start to see a, you know, an even greater uh, agitation between states, especially when states like Missouri are trying to pass a law that would make it literally a criminal offense to assist somebody from Missouri who might want to come to Illinois to exercise her rights. Governor J.B. Pritzker, uh, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your, uh, sharing your views on this, uh, on this highly charged day. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. All right, and let me go to somebody who's got quite a hornet's nest on her hands, the Attorney General of Michigan. Uh, you've said, we've talked about this before, you said, look, you are not going to uh, enforce this 1931 ban, but you've also made clear that um, you can, you know, prosecutors below you could. So, what happens next, and what ha what ha it in in that 
respect. And, and what can you do to, to protect uh, the ability of women to, to get access to abortion in Michigan? Well, thanks for having me. Um, firstly, uh, right now, our very draconian 1931 law that does not allow for exceptions for rape, no exceptions for uh, incest, no exceptions uh, for emergency medical procedures, no exception for the health of the mother. Um, the only very vague exception is to save the life of the mother. And, you know, I think for a lot of doctors, they're not going to be entirely certain what that means because there's a lot of times where this procedure is re required and there might not be a 100% chance that a woman will die, but maybe there's a 50% chance or a 70% chance. Is that enough to not get prosecuted? There's really no way to know. So for me personally, I've said that, you know, as the top law enforcement official in this state, I will not enforce the law. In addition to that, I represent our licensing and regulatory agency with the state. Uh, and we're the ones who are in charge of bringing complaints uh, and, you know, defending and representing the Board of Medicine, uh, you know, mm -hmm. nursing boards, all the medical providers. And I said, I will not allow the staff from my office to participate in measures to discipline healthcare providers uh, from a licensing perspective because they are performing what yesterday were totally legal procedures in our state. Um, so that's that's what I can do. I am really, you know, I, I filed an amicus brief on behalf of the governor before the Michigan Supreme Court in support of her argument. And, you know, I'm encouraging people to vote uh, in November and to make sure that not only are they supporting pro-choice candidates all the way up and down the ballot, but that they are supporting the reproductive freedom for all ballot proposal that would codify what were fundamental rights for us under the U.S. Constitution into the Michigan Constitution. Uh, but let me ask you, if a, a prosecutor below you, uh, uh, on a, lo a local prosecutor, chooses to enforce the 1931 law, what can you do about that? I don't feel as though I have the authority to tell a duly elected prosecutor uh, from any county in the state what they can and cannot charge. Only a court can do that. And again, right now we have a preliminary injunction that I believe applies not just to me and my office, but to all prosecutors in this state. But later in the event that, for instance, uh, the governor's case fails or the Planned Parenthood case fails, I mean, the, the only thing I can say is that at least in the counties uh, where we have Democrats uh, who are prosecutors who have pledged also not to enforce the law, and then of course I won't be enforcing the law, that at least that's some measure of security. But since there's a six year statute of limitations and we have term limits in our state, you know, I can't say that that is gonna present the, the kind of protection that I would want if I was either a, 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 you know, a physician or a medical provider or if I was a woman seeking an abortion. Tell me more about the referendum. Is, there, is it definitely going to be on the ballot? And this would enshrine it in the Constitution. And I guess, is there, could it, could, could a legislate, could a Republican governor and Republican legislature somehow overturn that? Yeah, it would be total reproductive rights that would be enshrined in the Constitution, not just abortion, but also birth control. And also things like um, in vitro fertilization, which now would also be outlawed, uh, outlawed in Michigan, because you know essentially you have an egg and a sperm, you have fertilization, right? Even though it occurs outside the womb, if a fertility clinic was to discard that, I believe that that would fit under this four-year felony in our state. So it would also enshrine that into the Constitution. And the answer to your second question is no. No legislature or governor could come along later. And, and somehow supersede what would be uh, a provision of our Constitution. It would be a constitutional right in the state of Michigan. It'd be very, very difficult to remove later. So when you enshrine the right into the Constitution, what specifics are in that right, or does a legislature then ha uh, have the ability to, to, change, to deal with the specifics, in, for instance, viability and, and things like that? So there's a little bit of wiggle room the way that the uh, the ballot proposal reads um, for later term pregnancy, although it does protect, you know, the, the health of the mother 
Uh, it also, you know, accounts for cases where you have fetal abnormalities, um, which, you know, are usually the cause of, you know, late-term uh, right. abortions. It would it'd be in that type of situation. But, you know, for the most part, it would provide all the protections that most people in this state would like to see. And it would not allow for the uh, legislature to intervene at that point. Is it essentially Roe, enshrining Roe, or is it a little... Or is it? Do you feel is this is this amendment uh, actually a little better than Roe? I'd say it's a little better than Roe. Okay. Dana Nessel, uh, the Attorney General of Michigan. Like I said, this is uh, something I, I'm, I'm sure you didn't think you were going to be dealing with this, even when you ran before. Always was a possibility, but I don't think a lot of us thought this day was going to well, come. Chuck, I actually ran a commercial on this when I ran for office in 2018. So I had an entire commercial predicting this and saying that I thought it would happen. Uh, in in my first term, if I was to be elected, and that this was my position, so the voters elected me with this information in mind. So I'm just well, I'm just keeping my campaign promise. You're a bit more prescient, uh, uh, and something uh, we should be well aware of. Dana Nessel, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Meanwhile, for folks on the other side of this issue, pro-life activists, today's Supreme Court ruling is a long-awaited moment of victory following a decades-long effort to overturn Roe. Joining me now is the president of the National Right to Life Committee. It's Carol Tobias. Carol, really appreciate you coming on. And let me just start with, with uh, the 50-year campaign, if you will. Um, is this the end? Is this success? Or is this the end of the beginning, as far as you're concerned? Like Winston Churchill said, this is the end of the beginning. Um, it's been a 50-year battle to protect unborn children, uh, but we now have those battles in every state. Um, so we are going to be doing what we can to affect those laws. Um, but we know it's going to be a long, long battle to get where we really want to be, is to protect all unborn children. Do you want to see this continue to be a state issue, which was a, a rallying cry for years, or would you eventually like to see the federal, uh, a sort of a federal codification against abortion, a federal ban on abortion? At this point, step by step, we're going to do what we can in the states. I think everybody is realistic enough to know that doing a federal law is going to be overwhelming. Uh, and at that point, it's not going to happen until we get large and general consensus among the population. And, uh, you know, that's obviously not going to happen anytime soon it does does natural right to life have a do you have a uh what you believe should be you know should women have access to an abortion at some point during their pregnancy or are you uh advocating for a ban at conception what is missing from this entire debate and the guests that you had on uh before me mm -hmm. is the fact that there is an unborn child whose life is hanging in the balance with every abortion that is performed, that that life ends. So no, we believe that unborn child is a human being that should be protected. If the mother's life is in danger, obviously we are not going to ask her to sacrifice her own life uh, for that of, of her child. Um, and I know so many, some mm -hmm. women who really agonize as they go through that. Um, but we see the unborn child as a human being that is deserving of protection. So it sounds like, I mean, I guess it goes to when does when does the constitutional rights of the fetus trump the constitutional rights of the woman? I don't think it has to be a competing right. Um, there are pregnancy centers that are going to help a woman who is going through a difficult time. Uh, many states have come forward with uh, programs to encourage and promote uh, childbirth to help a woman with various needs, uh, whether it is um, housing or some kind of um, health checkup from a, a local nurse. Um, I think the states are, are realizing that we are going to have to uh, promote childbirth and support the women in a variety of ways. The pro-life movement has been doing that for 50 years, and that's not going to end. We're going to step up those activities because we realize there are more women who are going to be wanting and needing uh, support and care. Is the next is the next step personhood, uh, so-called personhood, which means, you know, we, we've seen some of those. I think Mississippi was one where there was a high profile amendment, constitutional amendment um, attempt. Um, is that something that you expect National Right to Life to be working on in places where you can make that a ballot initiative? Well, National Right to Life actually issued what we would call model legislation uh, last week. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be that abortion is not allowed unless the mother's life is in danger. 
but we do realize that in several states that's not going to be practical at this time. So there are other exceptions like rape and incest that could be written into the bill. Um, it's a model and states could look at it and say, we like this part of it, we don't like this part. Uh, I really think we're gonna see a lot of different bills mm -hmm. coming up from the states with a lot of different um, interests and, you know, I don't wanna say exceptions, sure. but um, some changes. Do you expect this to be back in the Supreme Court? So for instance, if, if a state does pass a, a law that grants rights to the unborn, that sounds like something that would go back to the Supreme Court. Is that something you expect to happen at some point? Oh, I think there is going to be uh, several court battles over the next few years. Um, some of the st states that support abortion are going to um, try to push the Supreme Court to see if they're really going to stand with what they did today. Uh, Pro-life states will pass legislation, and I'm sure groups like Planned Parenthood will come in and try mm -hmm. to challenge it. And then we'll just see where the, where the federal you know, courts go. I don't know how many of them will reach the Supreme Court, um, but I, I expect court battles for a few more years. And let me ask you about contraception. Um, and the thing is, is that some things are seen as contraception and some people see, for instance, an IUD, view that as, a, as an abortion. Um, does National Right to Life have a position on contraception? Do they want to see more limitations on it? Or are, are you an organization that doesn't want to see it touched? We have no position on contraception, and I know that is, I believe it's, it's being brought up, that is a scare tactic. I do not know of any state that is going to, or is even going to try to get rid of contraceptives. I mean, that's, that's a red herring that's being pulled across. I think Idaho, no I do think there's them. a couple of legislatures, from very conservative ones, thought, I think there's so already a bill. They're not going after contraceptives. In Idaho, that was, that was certainly, certainly I think in being voted on at least in one or two states. What you're saying is that is not something your organization is campaigning on? Not at all. all right. The legislation that we promote uh, specifically requires that it, um, the process start with a, known, a woman who is known to be pregnant, um, which pretty much rules out a lot of you know, questions about contraception, but we have no interest in going after that. Carol Tobias um, from the National Right to Life. I know uh, uh, this is a pretty big day uh, in the pro-life movement. Uh, I appreciate you sharing a few minutes with me. Sure. Thank you. You got it. Well, I don't know if there's been a bigger week uh, in American politics here in Washington, D.C. in quite some time. The abortion rule. Uh, oh, don't forget yesterday, all the news on guns, both from the court and from the Senate. And then there's the January 6 hearings. Where do we even begin to unpack this conversation? I'll have a really smart panel with me to dig into as much of it as we can. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As I said, this is some week, uh, a day that will go down in history, and it was a pretty big week, the day the Supreme Court ended a constitutional right to abortion. It's also a week that will go down in history for a number of reasons. For the first time in 30 years, Senate passed a bipartisan bill related to guns. It is now headed to the president's desk because the House also passed it. The same day that a Supreme Court ruling made it easier to carry a gun in public in certain states. And we also heard some stunning testimony in yesterday's January 6th hearing. It's former President Trump's Justice Department officials described just how truly close the country came to a constitutional crisis. Individually, each one of these are major moments in politics. Each one has the ability to influence voters on both sides of the aisle. And as we head into the midterms, it's increasingly clear that the 2016 election was one of the most consequential in the history of this country. Uh, I know I've got a bunch of history buffs on here. Um, that, and I'll be curious of where you guys land on that declaration. But we've got Leanne Caldwell, uh, who's, of course, the host of Washington Post Live, anchor and early 202 co-author. Nice to see you. Brad Todd, Republican strategist. Sochi Inoosa, former director of communications for the Democratic National Committee. And Katie Benner, Brenner, who covers the Department of Justice for the New York Times. Um, we'll get to the historical uh, debate. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going 2016, 1876, but some want to put in 1932 as well. But we'll go from there. Um, where are we going next, Leanne? And, and I say this more big picture. We are piling a lot of stuff on the American public to sort of digest and deal with. 
Yeah, it's been a lot for me to digest and deal with in the last 24, 48 hours. You know, especially as a reporter who covers Congress, the entire past few weeks was focused on the gun issue. Um, and shockingly and surprisingly, the Congress was able to do something. They passed significant gun legislation today through the House of Representatives. It's going to the president's desk. And that is completely overshadowed by another whiplash of something that is dramatically going to have a major impact on the American people. And Senator Collins said in her statement that this really helps to undermine the Supreme Court decision today on Roe undermines people's faith in the institutions. People are not looking for big swings, big changes. They are looking for maybe things that are incremental. And she says that this is doing damage. And she might be right. Look, it is a concern. I mean, you know, we sometimes punish anybody that tries to go too far one way or the other as an electorate. Uh, Katie, you covering justice. Um, I was, you know, you don't always hear this attorney general get as uh, sort of involved in a hot issue like this. He got very involved. What what does he think? What how much do, is he planning on getting involved in how states are going to? Uh, try to decide how to interpret this law. Sure. For, so first, taking a step back, this is an issue that Attorney General Garland has thought is a, a key civil rights issue. He thinks civil rights is going to be for him. He hopes that it's part of his legacy as Attorney General. And as part of that legacy, he feels that helping with, to protect the right to an abortion is a top priority. He was heavily involved in the department's argument before the Supreme Court on the Texas abortion law. Mm -hmm. He's been heavily involved in this. So he has said today that he wants to use every tool that the department has in order to help protect the right to an abortion. Now, as we all know, those tools are very narrow. He's already called on Congress and said the only real way to codify this right is through Congress. So he's asking for that. He's asking for a bipartisan deal or any deal, but it would have to be bipartisan. For the department, it's protecting states' rights, the states that have already passed laws that codify and protect abortion. And it's being on the lookout for things like um, curbs on travel across state lines, the department would fight that. Looking at legislation around the use of medication for abortion, is there a way in which those states' laws bump up against things that the FDA has already approved? You know, that's where the Justice Department would intervene as well. All right, the political fallout, I, my, my initial reaction is this may level the, the um, I hate the word, use the word enthusiasm, but, but that is essentially the election intensity issue. Clearly, Republicans are a lot more interested in this election. Do you think it, it ends up balancing this out a little bit? So I do think that turnout will be up in this election. I think Democrats across the board were, are worried about turnout. They're worried about they're, they're the party in power. When you're in the party in power, you actually have to turn out your base. And your base won't necessarily turn out unless they have something that they're excited about or they're angry about. Well, now people are really angry. People are really scared. People are really worried. And I think that they will turn out. What worries me the most, though, is young people, young people who said, I voted in 2020, I voted for Democrats, I voted for Joe Biden, and this still happened. So what are you telling me to do? You're telling me to fix this by going out to you vote again? You just told me that two years ago. You just ago. told me that two years ago, and I turned out. What we need to tell them, and to your point about 2016, Chuck, is that elections not only have consequences, but we are feeling the consequences of the 2016 election now. And we will continue to feel those consequences unless we add more governors in, in red states, Democratic governors in red states flip those seats, add more senators, and keep the majority. That's the only way that we get through this. And so my worry is those young voters, and the Democratic Party has to be spending money to talk to them directly and tell them, this is a result of 2016. You did not necessarily, all of you, turn out, right? We weren't motivated to turn out. You turned out in 2020. Let's continue that. That's the only way that we reverse this. Brad, the agitated are sometimes motivated, and the, um, the those that are satisfied, you know, okay, I don't have to worry about this anymore. This has been a great get-out-the-vote issue. Does this at all sort of pop the car? You yeah. have the country at a 70% wrong track rating for this administration. Inflation's through the roof. Gas is over five bucks a, a gallon. People are going to show up to vote. But, you know, it's, it's really a good day for the democratic process. For 50 years, abortions divided our country. We've been divided for every day since 1973. And today the issue goes back to the electorate. The electorate gets to pick through its elected officials which way it wants this abortion policy in its states to go. So we've heard a lot of talk in the last year and a lot of reflection, I think, about what our democracy means. If you are serious that you think that democracy sh should be controlled by the people through elections, you should be happy today regardless of which side you're on the I, issue. I want, I want you guys to dig into something, a, th a thesis that uh, potentially. I think that in a row world, it, 
abortion was used as a wedge with Democrats. Democrats would debate each other about, uh, all right, what about late-term abortions? And, and, the, and the Republicans would usually be successful on that. In this world, isn't it the Republicans that might be having internal fights about, okay, where do we draw the lines and exceptions? And are you concerned that this is going to sort of divide the party in ways that maybe we haven't thought about right now? Well, I think, you know, as you won't be surprised at this, but I have a lot of polling in Senate battleground states <laughs> this year. Uh, and we asked them, do you think that states should be able to regulate abortion? In Senate battleground states this year, a strong majority of them, well over 50 percent, say yes, they should be able to regulate How do they want it regulated? Well, that's going to be debated in state capitals for years, for two or three or five or ten years. I mean, in st many states who have laws in the books are going to go back and revisit them. That's going to happen in red states. It's going to happen in blue states. Uh, but, you know, we also ask people in Senate battleground states, how about the Senate Democrat position, which is abortion on demand, anytime, all the way up to birth. And only 30 percent, that's, that's in the bill they voted on, that's the bill. Only 30 percent of people in Senate battleground states agree with that. That's going to be on the ballot, too. Uh, not just what, what happened at the court today, but what Senate Democrats would like to do if they keep control. But, Chuck, what I would tell you is that Dem Republicans said, and, you know, that they, some of them ran on overturning Roe. People didn't necessarily believe them, but like, where does it stop? And I do think that there will be a wedge in the Republican Party. And you heard your guest right before saying, we're not going to go after contraception. Well, people said that they were going to go after Roe for a period of time, too. They will go after contraception. And I think what's interesting about the Republican Party right now is they've always been the party there's about— no, There's, there's, what, no, there's which, no state doing which, that. There's which, no state, no Republican in Congress doing there that. There are mm. talks about it. And what I will say is the Republican Party has always been about less government involved in people's lives. And this decision mm -hmm. and what they're pushing now is more government. They're controlling what women um, do with their bodies, and you're going to continue to see that. We've seen that from the Republican Party recently in many, during many, many policies. More proof that abortion is overshadowing everything. I did want to sort of touch very quickly on January 6th, and especially, Katie, I have you here with Merrick Garland and with what's... It, it does feel as if, as Congress, members of Congress are getting agitated that the Justice Department was being aggressive, all of a sudden we get a lot of public Justice Department subpoenas and... Uh, and and showing up at people's houses, um, what's happening there? And it, it is what's more likely that he will charge the president, or he's going to do a special counsel? Well, I would say that some of is a little bit coincidental because the Democrats were going to be mad from the first day he took office. So the idea that the Justice Department would take action while the Democrats were angry was definitely going to happen if the Justice Department took action at all. In terms of whether or not he would charge Donald Trump, I I don't like to predict those things because being wrong has real consequences. But I would say two things to look at closely. When you look at what's happened with the Senate, oh, excuse me, with the House committee's own presentation, mm -hmm. they have presented both new evidence about uh, links between possibly illegal unconstitutional behavior in the mouths of Republicans. It's Republicans saying this to the committee. This was unconstitutional. This was illegal. Mm -hmm. So if nothing else, I do think that it's helping to turn public sentiment toward the idea that what happened was seriously wrong and there could be something illegal about it. And that is helpful, I think, in any kind of prosecution, especially one that would be as touchy and as controversial as prosecuting somebody close to the president's inner circle, mm -hmm. much less the president himself. The second thing to remember is that this is going to take a long time. Yeah. Merrick Garland is going to move slowly and deliberately. If you look at the Oklahoma City bombing from the day of the bombing until the day that the guilty verdict was handed in, it was almost two years. That was one crime, one charge. They apprehended the suspect almost immediately. It was still mm -hmm. two years. This is much more complicated. Leanne, the fallout of the pardon asks there, is this, it's, you know, I had somebody ask me this, all the one, all these Republican congressmen that asked for pardons, does it politically hurt them at all? I, look at the districts that right. they are from. Yeah, that's what no, it doesn't hurt them politically at all. Although Matt Gates has a serious primary challenge, challenger, I, I, you know, that is actually using some of this. Yeah, uh, yeah. but I mean, there, there's a lot, uh, you know, the pardon thing I don't think as much. However, there is the issue of January 6th and how Republicans acted about, re responded to this process is an issue in the primaries. Did you vote for the creation right. of an independent commission? Did you uh, support, how are you responding to January 6th now? Take the primary on Tuesday, Rodney Davis versus an incumbent. This coming Tuesday, yeah. Mary Miller. Rodney Davis voted. He, he was on the, he was appointed He may the lead committee. the next January 6th committee if he's in Congress. Right, exactly. He yeah. has lots of backing, but Trump backed Mary Miller because of his position on right. January 6th. Unfortunately, I have hit the time limit. Uh, Leanne, Katie, Brad, and Sochi, thank you all. Thank you all for being with us this hour. We'll be back Monday with more Meet the Press Now. I will see you Sunday. And meet the press on your local NBC News station. NBC now, News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. 
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.